All right, welcome back, everyone. Our next presenter comes to us from Colorado College uh, and worked in M cubed this summer in a, a unique project that we really haven't done before in SE, and it's a more of a convergent or collaborative project where Giancarlo worked with um, a group of mentors uh, alongside Ariana, who will be presenting next. Um, and it's focused around hurricane research and communication. Um, and so Giancarlo's um, mentors this summer were James Doan, Andrea Schumacher, and Alexandra Ramos Valle. The floor is yours, Giancarlo. Hi, right. hello everyone. Hey, my name is Giancarlo Villarde, and I had the pleasure to uh, work under James Doan, Alexander Ramos, and Andrea Schumacher this summer. Uh, today I'll be talking to you about the rapid intensification of North Atlantic tropical cyclones in a changing climate. So, this story comes with a little bit of a personal relation. Um, originally from Puerto Rico, and as many of you may know, in 2017, we were hit uh, with back-to-back -back hurricanes Irma and Maria, which were Cat 5 and Cat 4, respectively. Um, and here I show a little bit of the track of Hurricane Maria, which actually did rapidly intensify. Um, I will get into that definition uh, shortly. But this, uh, this track shows the hurricane driving straight through uh, the southeast side of the island and causing a lot of damage throughout. Um, and here, you know, you'll see a little bit of kind of that intensification that oh, I'm hinting at, where it jumps from a cat one to a cat five and then shortly descends through a cat four. Now, to give a little bit of the forecast ahead of time, on September 16th, uh, the NHC classified Maria as a tropical depression. Three hours later, it intensified to 55 uh, miles per hour winds thus deeming it a tropical storm. And one day later, increased to 75 mile per hour maximum sustained winds. And only an 18 hour period later after that, the storm intensified from category one to category five with winds up to 175 miles per hour. Now the intensification of this process went above uh, 70 knots in terms of intensity. Now what this ended up doing was Obviously, uh, for a small island like Puerto Rico, it's hard enough as is to prepare for such a crazy natural disaster, let alone two of them. And the, you know, being in Puerto Rico at the time, seeing the damages firsthand, um, it really does kind of put a lot of it into perspective of how, you know, even how big we may be, how uh, susceptible we are to so many uh, dangerous things. And uh, so, yeah, so just to give a little bit of an understanding of rapid intensification, the definition uh, refers to an increase of at least 30 knots within a 24-hour period. And um, this happens with a lot of hurricanes that we see even to this day. Uh, you may have heard of Hurricane Barrel, where that hurricane had intensified by uh, 35 knots just before hitting the coast of Jamaica. And um, yeah, to put that in perspective, Hurricane Maria also intensified by 70 knots, which just kind of shows the damages and the uh, dangers of having such a, a crazy storm. And uh, yeah. So what ends up happening is we all know that, uh, we can all know that global warming is, is definitely, uh, you know, increasing with climate change as well. And it's contributing to uh, much hotter sea surface temperatures, which is a driving and leading factor for hurricane speed and strength. And what we wanted to kind of find is to see that relation with uh, rapid intensity or rapid intensification of hurricanes. Now, one of the major difficulties with RI um, which is rapid intensification, is that it prevents a lot of difficulties for meteorologists in the terms of forecasting. Because if you imagine having a category one storm that you are seeing traveling on a certain track, and then all of a sudden jumps up to a cat five moving faster and a much bigger, uh, I guess in terms of uh, radii, it's a very scary thing to kind of be uh, tasked with in terms of responsibility. And the dangers of that uh, rely in a lot of different uh, manners with uh, not being able to be prepared enough the damages being a lot more than what you can even prepare for, and a variety of other things. So with this research, uh, one of the main focuses that we had coming into this were to be able to assess kind of the changes that have happened throughout time um, of RI events over the past uh, four decades. So we have basically done analysis. What we want to do is do an analysis from 1980 to 2000 and 2001 to 2021 to basically quantify the difference between how RI has changed throughout climate change and throughout those 20-year periods. So the next objective that we had uh, coming into this project was also to investigate certain atmospheric and oceanic uh, conditions that contribute to RI. Those including sea surface temperature, rap uh, relative humidity, uh, vorticity, and wind shear. Um, lastly, 
uh, one of the aspects of the project that we wanted to focus on were to be able to find what climatic conditions um, or what RI, how RI would behave in future cases with different uh, climatic conditions, especially with the aspect of climate change. So in order to do this, we use the herd data set from NHC to basically look over the North Atlantic uh, re region. And from there, as I mentioned earlier, we would run a RI mapping code that would show all the instances of rapid intensification from 1980 to 2000 and 2001 to 20, uh, 2021. From there, we ended up running comparison, a comparison analysis between the two periods. And from there, uh, we ended up getting our results. The latter part of the project, which was more focused on the environmental conditions side, uh, is we wanted to develop a RI data frame, which basically was a long list, trust me, it was long, of every RI point in terms of latitude, longitude, the start time, and the intensity that it changed. Uh, from there, we ended up using a historical environmental data set uh, using the ERA-5, which was an observed data set. Uh, basically to find all of the parameters that we were looking for, so like SST, relative humidity, vorticity, and wind shear. And from there, uh, ended up calculating their climatology across the, um, across the entire like 40-year period. So then from there, we'd calculate the difference and see uh, kind of how RI has been uh, played with in terms of climatology and climate change especially. So here, I'm going to show you a little bit of the 1980 to 2000 RI map. Uh, you can see... In this uh, region, you see some clustering in the central and eastern Atlantic, uh, which is actually in concordance with a lot of the literature that uh, was read beforehand, showing an increase in RI frequency in that region. Um, and a lot of major events in the western Atlantic region. Um, I do actually have a point, which is great. Um, but it doesn't work, so not so great. It's delayed. I don't know, but that's OK. It doesn't matter too much. <laughs> The red, the red dots are showing that uh, major intensity. And um, obviously, you can see those two in the cent western central area. Uh, those are increases from 65 to 70 knot changes, which if you think about it in terms of miles per hour, um, actually, I don't know the conversion, but it's a lot. Um, so looking at this region uh, from the kind of like 90 west to 70 west region, uh, you can see a, a major clustering of a lot of RI events, right? And this might actually be uh, you know, somewhat alarming because in that region, we, we do see a lot of hurricanes that actually do swipe up, uh, including Ida, and go through to uh, either Texas or Louisiana, sometimes curving back into Florida. So a lot of these are posing real threats, not to us here in Colorado, but obviously other states and uh, places in, in uh, you know, the Western Hemisphere. Next, I want to show the difference between 2001 and 2021. As you can see, a lot more red points, put simply. And not only that, but a lot more frequent, uh, more frequent changes and a lot more uh, points that are distributed on the graph. On the right side, you're seeing a little bit of a, uh, the change in 24 hours. This is a data set that was run through NHC. And it's kind of showing a very similar trend of that southern uh, like part from 20, to 20 degrees north to 10 degrees north, showing that concentration. But the main uh, point that I wanted to make is showing that higher density of strong 55 to 70 knot changes in the 20 degree to 10 degree north and 80 to 60 degree west uh, region. And that's shown here just below uh, Cuba. So what this has ended up showing is there are a lot of instances from this 2001 to 2021 uh, region that are showing this rapid intensification. And a lot of these storms actually do really, uh, uh, end up resulting in a lot of damages that can't or not can't, but haven't been uh, perceived in the past. And to be able to put that and quantify it in a much easier to digest way, we have this graph that's showing basically the comparison of those two um, periods, right? We have 1980 to 2000 and 2001 to 2021. And as you can see at all levels, 2001 to 2021 is having more RI occurrences. Now, what does this mean for us? Well. It means that we can tell that RI is changing over time, not only in terms of frequency, but also severity. But obviously, this is just an absolute number of RI. And uh, it comes with a kind of a question where, OK, but what if uh, you, know, you have certain, uh, certain years that have more storms? Um, and that kind of might may, uh, you know, stray the data. So from here, we ended up normalizing the data, showing from three different levels, 30 knots and above, 40 knots and above, and 50 knots and above in terms of intensity. And the trend lines are also indicating an increase in frequency of RI cases. Now, 
uh, what this ends up showing is throughout time, we're having a lot more RI. And uh, yeah, so the next part of this, we wanted to kind of look more into the uh, environmental side of the, um, I guess, of the you know, uh, investigation. And from here, uh, we ended up going with the ERA-5 uh, data set, using that to calculate SST and the climatology of that. Now, these are both uh, taken in Kelvin. Uh, what, this, what this graph is basically showing is taking the climatology, which is an average of, from those 40 years, what the, um, sorry, what the sea surface temperature was at that exact point of RI. So if you had, let's say, a case um, I could show here, if you ended up uh, pointing to that red one on the top, right? It would take that longitude and latitude coordinate and basically run it through to find the um, average sea surface temperature and obviously the other environmental conditions as well. But for this case, it would take the average sea surface temperature from those three months, those summer months of, of uh, July, August, September. And uh, from there, it would calculate with no lag, basically where the, the tropical cyclone is directly on the point, and then one day lag and two day lag. Now, the reason being that we chose these one and two day lags is because obviously the climatology and the uh, actual environmental conditions would change on that one point if we did end up just taking um, measurements from when the hurricane's on there for a variety of reasons that I'll get into as well. But looking at, dr drawing your attention to the right hand uh, graph, it's basically showing uh, that you have a slight weight of the lags on, um, basically what this is is a difference of the uh, no lag, one day lag, two day lag from the climatology. So zero is set at the average climatology for that point. And it's showing here that the no lag uh, is relatively uniform around that average point, but the one day and two day lags are a little bit skewed to the right. Um, if we were to improve this graph, what we would probably do would actually be a separated analysis of uh, 1980 to 2000 and then uh, 2001 to 2021, because that would basically show you the difference of the two, you know, those two periods in terms of SST. What we think happened here with the no lag, which is the orange bar, is that it's kind of being weighed down a little bit from the 1980 to 2000 uh, period just because of the temperatures have been uh, different from those times. The next uh, environmental uh, uh, variable that we looked at was relative humidity. And here you can see from just straight off the bat, the climatology is in the red. And you see on the no lag that we're seeing a lot higher relative humidity. Now what this is basically communicating is actually to be expected because it's just showing how uh, TCs or tropical cyclones are actually bringing in moisture to the regions that they go into. And uh, actually a little sneak peek of what we're going to be looking at uh, in the future with this project. But all in all, you are seeing um, higher mid-level um, moisture is actually benefiting and RI is occurring, occurring at those zones where you have a more moist environment at that mid-level. Um, the next variable we were looking at was vorticity which is basically um, just the level of like, disturbance and, and spin of that area. So you see here on the no lag side, on the right hand side, um, after it was differentiated from the climatology, that we are seeing that kind of weight of vorticity there as well. And this part was more of the unexpected uh, region of the project, where we were looking at wind shear, which is notoriously uh, known for disturbing tropical cyclones and hurricane formation. But in this case, it was kind of showing that you know, we ended up having a more weighted side, especially on the lag, of where the RI was occurring. Now, this is leaving a lot of room for future study, but what we speculate is actually occurring is the wind shear is actually ventilating the TC more and allowing it to rapidly intensify uh, just due to that added ventilation. Um, so moving forward, we would like to uh, apply this project to multiple different uh, definitions of RI just to be able to kind of corroborate the information that we have uh, come out with. Uh, aside from that, maybe conduct a, a deeper exploration of the significance of the environmental conditions, being able to make a study showing uh, why the certain variables are actually uh, influencing RI the way they are, and uh, maybe have more conclusive results showing the importance of each individual uh, variable. Even though they're all interconnected, uh, it would be cool to see kind of the weight that they each carry. Um, aside from that, we also want to conduct a futuristic study using WARF models comparing um, actualized and observed uh, 2000 to 2013 hurricane data to futurized uh, uh, 2070 and two, or 2100 uh, climatic conditions to see how that might also change. And uh, aside from that, which is the big part that I'm looking forward to uh, continuing the study, is the 
study of effects of RI on landfall precipitation to kind of see what uh, levels are different from just normal uh, hurricanes that bring in uh, precipitation. Because as many of you may know, uh, flood risk is at, and flood damages are typically the uh, most dangerous part of, of a lot of hurricanes and tropical cyclones. So all in all, we are able to conclude that RI is increasing both in frequency and intensity. Sea surface temperature is, being, is proving to be a leading driver in terms of fueling these uh, rapid intensification points. And it is occurring more at more mid-level uh, moist environments. Uh, wind shear unexpectedly plays a supportive role. And there has to be a lot more work done in terms of RI because it is very uh, understudied, but also just um, not very well understood uh, region of atmospheric science and, and meteorology. And uh, yeah, from there, uh, we'll end up using our, our futuristic uh, climate study. And uh, yeah, so I wanted to say thank you to all the mentors, everybody who has helped out throughout this project, and um, my beautiful friends from everyone in the crowd. So thank you. Wonderful work, Giancarlo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have some questions from the audience? Again, uh, both in person and online, for those of you that are Joining us online today, there is a Slido. If you scroll down, you can ask questions through that Slido. Yeah, nice. There we are. Nice job. Tim, I'm Tim Schneider from NCAR in the Research Applications Lab. Um, so could you go back to the histograms of the SSTs, the um, I, m I missed a little bit that the idea, well, I guess it applies to all of them, but the idea of, of the lag, can you, I didn't quite grasp that, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, so are you more asking just kind of a like better explanation? Is Not necessarily better, just maybe again. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries, yeah, yeah. So basically what we have here on the right-hand side um, is showing like, the no lag, one day lag, and two day lag uh, differentiated from the climatology. So this is like an above or below average study. Um, the one part that might have been confusing is how the no lag kind of shows a kind of almost like even trend uh, uh, along the climatology. And that was kind of where I ended up branching into how in the future it'd probably be a better and more, um, I guess, tale telling story to to end up separating the two periods from 1980 and the 2001 and so on. Um, but what it is showing there with the, the one day and two day lags is that typically the points at which the uh, rapidly intensif uh, rapid intensification is occurring, two or one day before, it's higher than the climatology average temperature. So what this actually looks like is um, I can direct your attention to 302 and then the 0.5 as well for the Kelvin. Um, what that is showing is that same bar that you see on the right-hand side, which is uh, protruding as well. Um, and that's basically around like, yeah, 29 degrees uh, Celsius, which is above just the normal average as well. So um, yeah, I think in a future study, I would definitely be able to generate a graph that would be, I guess, more easy to understand in terms of uh, kind of seeing what the no lag looks like, especially. And you probably have a lot more telling information with one day and two day lags. But yeah, hope that answers your question. No, that, that's perfect. I just I missed that point about what the leg, how you define the leg. So oh, okay. that was really helpful. And yeah, it's interesting stuff. And you know, we, we know hurricanes are driven by energy, right, mm -hmm. from the sea surface. So it's, it's gratifying to see a result showing that, too. Thank you. Giancarlo, I have a question for you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Be nice, I promise. Um, just in, in, in your research, one of the things that kind of stood out to me, you really kind of focused on that Western Caribbean yeah. um, area. And one of the things that kind of jumped into my head is, was there any um, questions or intentions or thoughts about maybe breaking that down by, by months in hurricane climatology. And what I mean by that is that area historically in hurricane climatology is an October later season yeah. of the hurricane season to where you'll have hurricane uh, tropical cyclone genesis and then storms kind of get picked up by fronts and moved mm -hmm. uh, up towards the U.S. Um, I'd like to know, is, are they, is that happening during like October, during the times when that cyclogenesis usually happens in that region? Or are these storms coming across the Caribbean and then going through RI there? Mm -hmm. So it is a very interesting mix of both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we do see a lot of uh, rapidly intensification, uh, rapid intensification uh, right after the genesis as well. But as they kind of, uh, you know, 
in that region from the 40 to 20 degree west, it doesn't really pose a lot of danger compared to obviously the ones that rapidly intensify close to land, right. because from there they will not only will we not only have better uh, communication set to also be kind of like more prepared, but at the same time there are a variety of other atmospheric factors and oceanography. Uh, oceanogra I can't even say that word anymore, but uh, mm -hmm. factors that do that can actually end up changing the uh, severity of that storm. So the ones that we really do worry about the most, which are actually very intense, um, are the ones that are very close to the coast because they leave people a lot less time. Um, and in terms of even wanting to expand, not only just on the region, but also, or not, not even just on like the time set, but also on the region, the Eastern Pacific also has a very interesting story. We saw with Hurricane Otis, it caused a lot of damage and rapidly intensified at a monstrous rate right before hitting, um, I believe it was the coast of, uh, uh, I don't actually remember which coast. It, it, it was on that peninsula, but it basically was, because the, the, the danger of it as well is um, when it's so close to the coast that it rapidly intensifies, is not only the strength, but the time yep. of, of occurrence. Uh, it does end up changing the track as well. So it's just a variety of factors that we really don't want to see. Um, but yeah. yeah. I'd just be question. curious to see if there's any kind of, uh, just to suss out whether mm. it's happening in that region more so in October versus September or something like that. Just out of curiosity. Yeah, and, yeah. and totally hear you. Like if you have a, a RI happen in the East Atlantic, most likely it's going to be pulled poleward because it's got so strong so yeah. fast and it's going to be a fish storm. I think for that environmental condition analysis, it definitely would be worth it to kind of look at what's happening, especially towards the generous, Genesis in that uh, October season as well. So yeah, definitely give it a look. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Any more questions? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Ryan, you were first. Ooh, I love that question. Hey, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, very interesting. Um, my question kind of follows with Jerry's as well. Um, he was talking about uh, hurricane uh, climatology on, on uh, a monthly basis uh, yeah. for the seasonality of it. My mind went straight to seasonality in general and to ENSO. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, um, would there be a thought in your mind to continue this research for that uh, same eastern, uh, uh, eastern Atlantic mm -hmm. slash yeah, eastern area. Atlantic? Um, basically, to to inspect uh, how the the phases of ENSO actually mm. impact this, because uh, typically right around this time of year, and when we transition into La Nina, yeah you get the Central American gyre that's right there, which can actually help with the intense, uh, rapid intensification Very of hurricanes, true. Yeah, which is what we saw in barrel. Right. So maybe just that it's kind of more of a statement rather than a question or anything yeah. else like that. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a thought and piqued my interest. No, I'd love to answer. And I think Caitlin also had a similar question. I, I saw the chat uh, pop up briefly. But yeah, it, it's definitely within uh, the scope that I want to kind of look into. But what I would, the thought process, um, just like briefly, uh, was basically to compare ENSO years um, to those rapid intensification events because what I find very interesting is when doing this kind of uh, normalized study, you do see a lot of those peaks. And uh, we were actually wondering a lot if those would coincide with ENSO years or whether they're a niño or la niña. But yeah, uh, what you did say with Barrow is very true with the, um, how, it, how it does actually end up promoting rapid intensification. So I, I think that definitely is a very big part of the project that has to be uh, tapped into as well. But already dealing with a phenomenon like RI, which is already difficult to understand as is, combining with another one, yeah, it's definitely something to maybe put on the, put on the scope for, for when I have a little more time, you know, but yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, we can compare notes because I got some time series this Oh yeah, perfect, this, so. <laughs> sounds good. I love that. Apartment. I think we have a question um, online from Caitlin. Yeah. Let's jump to that real fast, and then we'll get Ariana up here. Oh, I've got a bunch of questions. Okay, so proud, Giancarlo. Yay, let's go, Giancarlo. No questions. Thanks, Just Brenna. Great job, Appreciate Madison. Um, Giancarlo from Caitlin. Excellent work. Have you noticed any correlation between ENSO and rapid intensification? So we just talked a little bit about that. I feel like we may have to bring yeah, you all back and do another bigger group project. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, what can we in the Caribbean expect over the next de decade, given the trends <laughs> you have identified? Well, uh, it's nice to see you, Manuel. Um, well, with, uh, with the given SSTs that will be increasing in the next decade, we can definitely expect to see a lot more rapid intensification. I can't say it uh, definitively, even though I just said definitely, but um, we, can, we can expect to see uh, 
that kind of intensification, which is definitely a scary thing to think because 2017 was already a monstrous season and then got followed up by another 2021 season. And who knows what we're going to see in this season. So honestly, it is a, a definitely a scary thing to, to kind of imagine, especially for uh, people living in those regions that are so uh, heavily impacted by this. But, um, you know, once I get my hands on a little WERF model, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. So <laughs> Nice. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Giancarlo. Thank you.